Welcome back, strangers. I'm Ethan with The Strangest, and tonight I'm joined by my lovely, super smart, amazing wife, Rebecca. We're going to be keeping it in the family and discussing familicide. Play intro. So what are the different types of familicide? Patricide is when someone kills their father. Matricide is when someone kills their mother. Parricide is when someone kills their parent, whether it be a step-parent or their birth parent. And familicide is when someone kills multiple close family members. Rebecca and I had a debate on whether or not matricide was even a thing. I kept thinking it would just be called patricide because that seems like it makes sense. You know, sometimes you just call things like the male equivalent. Yeah, gender inequality here. Yeah, I, th I didn't patricide, know. Patricide, matricide. What is one of the most famous examples of patricide? Well, one of the oldest examples is Oedipus, who killed his father and married his mother. Spoiler alert. So did you have to read Oedipus Rex when you were in school? No, I didn't. That sounds like, like Hamlet and the Lion King, just kinkier, kind of. Yeah, we had to read Oedipus in my school. What about another more modern example of patricide that most people would know, maybe? Yeah, another famous example is in The Force Awakens when, spoiler alert, Kylo Ren kills his dad, Han Solo. Han so Solo he, dies? Yeah. Fuck. Yeah, spoiler! But he did it so that uh, he could turn into a Sith. I thought that was another good famous example. But here's some real life examples. The rest, are the rest real life? Or do you have some yeah. more fictional ones? The first one we're covering, we've actually done a video on, is Charles Whitman, the Texas Tower shooter. So, Charles Whitman was an intelligent man with a seemingly normal upbringing. Whitman enlisted himself in the United States Marine Corps right after graduating high school without telling his family. Supposedly he decided to enlist because his father beat him and threw him in a pool when he came home drunk one night. He served at Guantanamo Bay and earned a sharpshooter badge because he was a good marksman with great accuracy. After his enlistment ended, he went to the University of Texas at Austin to study mechanical engineering. Whitman met his wife, Kathleen Glassener, at school. They got married rather quickly, but all seemed to be going well. Before the wedding, Whitman's grades were not that great. After the wedding, they improved some, but not enough to count for the Marine Corps. They issued him back on active duty and sent him to Camp Lejeune. Whitman was not happy about having to leave his wife and quit his studies. He was honorably discharged and allowed to return to his studies in 1964. Whitman was the main breadwinner of the family and worked several different jobs to make ends meet. This put a strain on the marriage, and Whitman was noted to have struck his wife twice. But he was afraid of being abusive like his father and was determined to break the cycle. In May of 1966, Whitman's mother, Margaret Whitman, announced she was divorcing Charles' father because of his continual abuse. Charles helped his mother move to Austin to be closer to him. During this stressful parental drama, his own marital problems, Whitman started to use amphetamines and started to have severe headaches. On August 1st, 1966, Whitman drove to his mother's apartment and stabbed her in the heart killing her. He left a note with her body saying he didn't know why he took his mother's life and that he was upset about doing it, but that she was going to heaven now, if there was one. He then returned to his home and killed his wife Kathy by also stabbing her in the heart. He then climbed the University of Texas Tower and opened fire, killing 17 people and wounding 31. He was eventually shot and killed by Austin police. So what caused Whitman to kill his mother? He said in his letters that he didn't know why he was killing his mother, and that he felt bad after doing it, and that he thought there was something wrong with his brain. And in his autopsy, it was found that he had a tumor in his brain. Could this be what made him kill his mother and all those other people? You think that's what made him matricide? Because he actually said in the letters that he thought there was something wrong with his brain. So he yeah. specifically said that he wanted an autopsy done to his head after after the killings because he thought there was something ma making him and he wasn't used to it. There's also people that said maybe he had PTSD or some other form of trauma. Yeah, from the Marines. Yeah, and with his like upbringing. I thought you said he had a normal upbringing and then you said his dad beat him. Rebecca's well, like, that's normal. Everyone well, I mean, has that happen to him. No, like his family didn't really have money problems. Like it was seemingly okay besides the fact that his dad hit him every once in a while. You can Is tell, that normal? I don't know. Yeah, you can tell Rebecca's upbringing <laughs> might not be normal. <laughs> Damn. 
No, I think the tumor had something to do with it. I've read other cases where like tumors, they change your, can change your chemical imbalance in your brain and make you do things and a lot of stuff. He knew something was going wrong in his brain. He wrote it down. He actually went to a therapist about it, but they said he was fine. And it's also kind of other people because no one else like kind of spoke out saying, hey, this guy's got something wrong with him. Kind of like society let him down a little bit. I don't want to say he's a hundred percent his brain tumor, but there's there's arguments both ways. So I mean, it's a horrific yeah. thing that happened to anyone. I mean, he did hit his wife. Rebecca, who's the next one we're going to talk about? Okay, so this next one might be familiar if you watched the Netflix show Mindhunter. Edmund Kemper III was a tall boy, ending up at six foot nine, who had some known quirks. He was noted to have antisocial behavior and exhibited cruelty to animals, such as burying his pet cat alive, digging it up after it had died, decapitating it, and mounting its head on a spike. Kemper was always close to his father and was devastated when his parents divorced in 1957. He moved to Montana with his mother, who he had a dysfunctional relationship with. His mother was a neurotic alcoholic who frequently humiliated, belittled, and abused him. Kemper was often made to sleep in a locked basement because his mother was afraid he would hurt his sisters. She refused to show Kemper affection because she thought it would turn him gay. She constantly told him that he reminded her of his father and that no woman would ever be able to love him. Kemper eventually ran away from his mother and moved back in with his dad, who was remarried at the time. He stayed there a short while before being sent to live with his grandparents. Kemper and his grandparents did not get along. He said his grandfather was senile and his grandmother was constantly emasculating him and his grandfather. On August 27, 1964, a 15-year-old Kemper got in an argument with his grandmother. He stormed out of the kitchen, got a rifle, and shot his grandmother in the head, which killed her, and shot her twice in the back. It was also noted that she had multiple post-mortem stab wounds. When Kemper's grandfather returned home from grocery shopping, Kemper went out to the driveway and fatally shot him. He didn't know what to do next, so Kemper called his mother, who told him to call the police. He was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic and was sent to Addis Gadero State Hospital, where he was supposedly successfully rehabilitated. So he was released on his 21st birthday, December 18, 1969, to his mother. His mother and Kemper had a tumultuous relationship and were constantly having blow-up arguments. Kemper finally moved out, but he was still unable to get away from his mother because she called him all the time and would show up unannounced to his house for surprise visits. Kemper started picking up hitchhikers, about 150 of them, before he started getting homicidal or sexual urges. Between May of 1972 and April 1973, Kemper killed eight people. He would pick up female students who were hitchhiking and then drive them out to a remote area and kill them by shooting, stabbing, smothering, or strangling them. He would then take them home, decapitate them, and have sex with their bodies, then dismember them. He was known as the co-ed killer because most of his victims were college-aged females. Kemper had to move back in with his mother where he would still bring back his victims. On April 20th, 1973, Kemper's mother came home from a party. She woke Kemper up when she came in and he went into his mother's room to talk to her. He waited for her to fall asleep and then he bludgeoned her with a hammer and cut her throat with a knife. He decapitated her and used her head for arumatio. Do we know what that is? That's where you put your thing in its mouth. Yeah. A decapitated head. I didn't know the official name for that, but I was able to piece that together from context clues, and yeah. that's pretty messed up. Yeah, he did that to his uh, co-ed victims also. Yeah. But uh, used her head for Irumadio and then used it as a dartboard. He then called her friend Sarah Sally Hallett over to watch a movie. When she arrived, Kemper strangled her so that he could say she and his mother were out on vacation together. Afterwards, he drove nonstop to Colorado and called the police to confess his crimes. This case seems to have more of a reason for matricide since his mother was abusive. Do you think Kemper was justified in his actions? I don't think really ever killing a parent is justified unless it was in actual like self-defense. So not in this situation because he did move in with her after the fact, but she did try to take care of him after 
he had killed her. I don't know whose grandparents was it. It was his, it was his it was dad's. His grand, dad. So yeah, it was his dad's grandparents. So she still took that risk to take care of him after all of that. So yeah, it's a whole sad situation. I don't get why he confessed after it. It said that um, he had to take a bunch of caffeine pills in order to drive nonstop because it was like a thousand mile drive. He took a bunch of caffeine to stay awake, drove nonstop, was convinced that there was a manhunt out after him, that everyone knew what he had done, they were after him. Came to realize no one knew and no one was looking for him, freaked out and then called the police. Yeah, it's probably the whole where the schizophrenic side comes comes from. The, yeah. He's a little crazy, but Mindhunter, he's literally the best part of Mindhunter. Yeah, they did a really good job. Like uh, when I was on the Wikipedia page for this, the picture, of Ed Kemper looks exactly like the guy who played him in Mindhunter. They yeah. did a really good job. So if you like slow true crime stories, Mindhunter or Mind Number. So we have one more matricide case apparently. Rebecca really went all out on this. She did wanted I to drive mean? that she wanted to drive the point home that matricide is a thing. It's not just patricide. There's three cases of all of them. Spoiler okay. alert. Oh I didn't know. So <laughs> we're just we're just getting started, you guys. <laughs> The last case of matricide we're going to talk about is also also had a show made about it, The Act. Although this one went on into a lot more details and backstory and crime than Mindhunter did with Kemper. And unlike Mindhunter, The Act was actually a really good show, according to Rebecca. Yeah, Ethan didn't watch it, but The Act is really good. Yeah, it wasn't. Really because covering all this stuff with the YouTube channel, I don't really like watching dark stuff because I have to read about it in my spare time. Yeah, so. well, the act, it's got like an 8 on IMDb. It's really good. Well, like, it took me a long time to want to watch Mindhunter because I knew it dealt with serial killer stuff. So. Yeah, well, I would watch the act five times before I watch Mindhunter ever again. Yeah, well, how do you say Gypsy Rose Blanchard? Blanchard? Mm -hmm. Blanchard. Bl Blanchard, okay. Gypsy Rose Blanchard had been sick all her life. Her mother, Claudine, or Dee Dee Blanchard, was convinced Gypsy had medical problems ever since she was three months old. What started out as sleep apnea turned into paralysis, which turned into leukemia, which turned into asthma, which turned into muscular dystrophy, and so on and so on. Dee Dee said Gypsy Rose was so sick due to a chromosome disorder and brain damage. When Gypsy was seven or eight, she got into a minor motorcycle accident with her grandfather and scraped her knee. This caused Dee Dee to place Gypsy Rose in a wheelchair, even though she was healthy enough to walk on her own. Dee Dee suffered from Munchausen syndrome by proxy, which is a condition where a caretaker fabricates or induces an illness in the person in their care so that they get sympathy, attention, or sometimes money from other people. Gypsy Rose was made to believe that she was sick when she wasn't, and even was a recipient of payouts from the Ronald McDonald House and the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Gypsy was made to present herself as younger than she was, and as someone with a disability and chronic illness. She was forced to have unnecessary surgeries, like having a feeding tube put in, and to take medicine she didn't need. Dee Dee shaved Gypsy's head, so she looked like a chemo patient. Dee Dee had Gypsy's salivary glands removed because of a drooling problem she said Gypsy had. The drooling was caused by Dee Dee using a numbing cream on Gypsy's gums before appointments. The lack of salivary glands and anti-seizure medicine Gypsy was on caused her teeth to rot, and most of her front teeth had to be removed. Dee Dee and Gypsy moved to Missouri from New Orleans from Hurricane Katrina into a house that was built for them by Habitat for Humanity. It was there where Gypsy began to make friends with neighbors and have some human interaction that wasn't with her mother, which is how she met her boyfriend, Nicholas Godijan. After talking online and Gypsy paying for Nicholas to come out to meet her, they devised a plan to murder Dee Dee so they could get together so Gypsy could escape. In June of 2015, Nicholas and Gypsy made good on their plan. Gypsy Rose let Nicholas go to John in the house after Dee Dee had gone to sleep. She gave him duct tape, gloves, and a knife to kill her mother. Although she claims she didn't think he would actually do it, Nicholas stabbed Dee Dee in the back multiple times, which killed her. Gypsy and Nicholas fled the scene, but were eventually caught because of posts they made on Facebook. Munchausen syndrome is a devastating condition, and after years of abuse from her mother, do you think Gypsy Rose was justified in having her killed to be able to escape? I know this isn't matricide per se, but Gypsy did orchestrate it all for her mother to be killed, so I think it's close enough. It's definitely close enough. It's all like premeditated. She did get someone else. I don't think it's 
I don't think the Nicholas guy really. I mean, he's trying to be a white knight, I guess, but I don't he think he had would. mental problems. Yeah, exactly. I think he's definitely more at fault than than the girl. They talk a lot more about it in the show, and I didn't want to include all the details and stuff because y'all should watch the act. He wasn't uh, mentally fit. And he had, like, a lot of interest in BDSM and stuff like that. Yeah, so I think I think he's definitely should... So did they get charged, both of them? How did that... Yes. Okay. He got convicted with first-degree murder, and yeah. she got convicted of second-degree murder, yeah. I think. I don't know. I think it's really dark. I think anyone, if something, that happens, something like that happened to him is horrible. I think her, like, if it was more built up rage and insult defense, it'd be more justified, but still. Like, I, that guy, I don't, he, did he, how far away did he drive? Do you know where he was from? Uh, one of the eyes, Indiana. Yeah, Illinois. so he drove across, like, state lines to come after they had to take and a come bus. kill her. Yeah, so that was straight, like, we're gonna kill, kill her. So. Yeah. They could have, he could have just as easily rescued her and ran away forever. Like, why did they have to they kill the mom? They tried, but her mom wouldn't let her out. Like, and I didn't talk about this either, but she had already tried running away with a man who she met at, like, a Comic-Con convention. She tried to run away, go stay with this dude she met at Comic-Con, and her mother, because she had had Gypsy Rose say she was younger than she actually was, she had told the guy that she was 13 or 14 or something and that she was going to call the police because he was with a child and he was like, please get this away from me. Yeah, I don't blame that guy. That guy's like, no, 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 that's that's not me. Yeah, so, so anytime she Gypsy tried to go anywhere, do anything, the mother found out and snatched her back. Do you know how old she was when this happened? Do you remember? Mm-mm. She was like 20, I yes. think. Nicholas came to meet Gypsy before, like they met at a movie theater. And Gypsy was like, just like hold the door for us and be nice to my mom and we'll act like we don't know each other and we're just meeting. And he does. And her mother is like, absolutely not. Do not talk to me. Do not talk to my daughter. Leave us alone. And wanted nothing to do with him. So that's when she was like, we gonna kill her. It's so dark. Yeah. So what's the next one? Do we finally, are we getting out of matricide? We're moving on to patricide. The father killings. The Kylo Ren's. Yeah, I don't know how to say any of these words. I was hoping you were going to be the one to read this one. What? Yeah. What? So, um... I'm glad I got, I'm glad I got <laughs> the order we got them in, because that would suck. Because this is really going to be hard. So bear with Rebecca. Yeah, so now we're going to Patricide, killing one's father. Our first case is the Tochigi Patricide case, which took place in Tochigi Prefecture, Japan. Our daughter in question, Chiyo Azawa was the first of six children of her father, Takio Aziwa. Takio was a chronic alcoholic who raped his daughter, Chiyo, for 15 years. Takio was married to Chiyo's mother, Rika, but she fled because of the abuse and left her daughter behind. She returned after several years to find that Takio was treating Chiyo like she was his wife. Takio got Chiyo pregnant 11 times, and Chiyo had five daughters with her father, two of which died in infancy. She eventually got sterilized after her sixth abortion. Chiyo eventually fell in love with another man, which made her father angry. He confined her to their house and threatened to kill her and their three children. On October 5, 1968, Chiyo strangled and killed her father, Takio. The neighbors didn't even know Chiyo was Takio's daughter and not his wife until she was arrested. In this case, Chiyo was convicted of killing her father, but her sentence was suspended. Yeah. It was like the first case like this in Japan. This is almost like the most justified one we've gotten to, so... But man, that's dark. Do you even think that's, that's possible? Or can yeah. you imagine a life like that? What would life even be like after that? I mean, how do you even have a normal one? I, mean, I guess it's good that she could even fall in love with someone else. I'm surprised you didn't have some sort of Stockholm Syndrome. Because that's like all you would know almost. Yeah. And they didn't really talk about like what happened to her after, but they talked about her like she was uh, insane. Yeah, you so would have to she might like not have something. been able to live free after that. Yeah. Next, we have two brothers, Alex and Derek King, who are 13 and 14 years old from Pensacola, Florida. This story is a little more complicated. Alex and Derek were abandoned by their drug-addicted mother, Kelly, and were left with their dad, Terry, who was unable to financially support the boys along with their two other half-brothers. 
Derek and Alex were eventually split up. Derek was having behavioral problems at his foster home, including being disruptive and doing drugs. He liked sniffing lighter fluid and became increasingly more interested in fire. Because of these behavioral problems, Derek was eventually returned to his father in 2001. Alex was also returned from his foster family and was made to live with his dad and Derek again. Terry was strict with the boys, but was never described as being abusive. Derek grew more uneasy with living with his father and having to follow his rules. Derek was also taking off his ADHD medication, Ridlin, by Terry. He took away Derek's stereo and TV because of his aggression, which caused Derek to have even more rage towards his father. Terry had a close personal friend, Rick Chavis. Because Terry and Rick were so close, Rick was around Derek and Alex and they would get to know each other. The boys liked being at Rick's house because he let them watch TV and play video games. Because of their increasing bond, Terry felt Rick and the boys' relationship was getting too close and ordered Derek and Alex to stay away from Rick. As it turned out, Rick was a convicted child predator, having been arrested for lewd behavior and assault on two 13-year-old boys. Alex and Rick had developed a sexual and romantic relationship. When police entered Rick's home, they found pictures of Alex above his bed and journal entries in which Alex wrote that Rick was his forever love and he was now gay because of Rick. It is evident by their writing and that the brothers have a lower mental capacity than other people their age with frequent misspellings and unclear thought patterns. Because of this, Derek's increasing instability and rage, and because of Alex's relationship with Rick, who he was now banned from seeing, the boys devised a plan to murder their father. Alex says it was his idea to kill Terry, but it was Derek who acted on it. Derek waited until his father was asleep, and then took a baseball bat and smashed Terry's head. The boys then set fire to the home in order to try to conceal the body. Their reasoning for killing their father was that they did not want to be punished for running away and their father was mentally abusive. The boys fled to Rick's house, who tried to hide them, but eventually they had to turn themselves in. The case turned from being focused on the brothers to being focused on Rick and the boys after Rick wanted them to live with him and the only way that could have happened was if Terry was dead. The boys confessed to killing their father and then went back on it and said that Rick was the one who murdered him while they stayed in the car. Eventually the boys were found guilty of second degree murder and Rick was acquitted on those charges. The back and forth on the boys depiction of the crime and their mental deficiencies in the case remind me a lot of what happened to Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey in the making of a murderer. What do you think of this case and the comparison between the two? But the thing that I was reading included clips of like their journal entries and how they wrote, and it's like very obvious that they weren't all. At least they journal. Like, wh how does everyone just journal? I'm reading like a book, and everyone's just like, in my journal, I reference this. Do you journal? No. I don't, yeah, I don't journal. But like hearing that, like being able to see that they had some mental deficiencies, and then like them having a story, confessing to it, going back, saying it was someone else, and then going back again just reminded me of Brendan Dassey and Stephen Avery. That's also like saying like all of this could have been coerced by police, but it just seems like no matter what, they were manipulated by another guy. They're already in maybe not the best situation with their dad and were taken advantage of by a known predator. Yeah, and it said that the dad never hit them, but what he would do would stare at them, and that was apparently enough to make them fearful. I don't know, all it said was that the dad would stare at them. Yeah. It doesn't seem like the best situation. It just seems like they were easy prey for someone that took advantage of them, and especially if they yeah. didn't have full mental capacity. Was the Rick guy convicted of like doing anything? He wasn't convicted in the murder, but he of the was- the sexual acts and yeah. stuff? That's, that's good, yeah, that's Yeah, like dark. the boys got in trouble for the murder and arson. But yeah, I didn't include in all of these like what ha what all happened to all of them, like how many of them were arrested and stuff, because you know most of them were. You're just leaving I, me on the edge of my seat with yeah. the outcomes of some of some these. of these people is free. Yeah, Rebecca just casually letting me know some of these people are free and they can come get us if they see this, this YouTube this video next and one's don't like free. us. Yeah. Well, who's the next one? Stacy Lannert was born in St. Louis, Missouri, in 1972, and was the daughter of Thomas Lannert. Thomas was a physically abusive alcoholic who started sexually abusing Stacy when she was eight years old and later went on to rape her when she was nine. 
Stacy's parents divorced when she was young, and Stacy tried to tell her mother what her father was doing to her, but because of her age, she lacked the language capabilities to describe what was happening. After her parents divorced, Stacy went to live with her mother in Guam. Stacy's sister, Christy, begged her to come back to her father because he would not let Christy live with Stacy and her mother. Stacy returned home to her father six months after moving. She came home late with Christy one night and noticed a rifle in the room. Stacy then decided to kill Thomas and shot her father twice while he was asleep on the couch. She confessed to the murder and said she did it because of the years of repeated abuse, both physically and sexually, and because of the threats he made against her to keep her quiet. Stacy was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, but eventually won an appeal that let her out of prison after having served 18 years. Do you think she was given too much time in her sentence for the crime she committed, or was that fair based on her circumstances? I mean, it sounds pretty fair. I mean, it was like years of built-up rage. She could, it happened when she was young enough to when she didn't know how to describe it. Yeah, so. that she tried to tell her mother, babysitter, and I think school counselor. And because she didn't know the words or what was happening to her, no one took her seriously because they didn't know what she was trying to say. So she tried to tell at least three different people and no one got it and so she just kept being abused yeah and you gotta think about like that mental toll of like years of abuse will take on someone and how that would affect them and their actions so some of these people it's almost like i'm glad they kind of got some sort of justice because you never know what if the the court system would have treated it fair our last category to talk about here is parasite slash familicide i'm using parasite to mean that they killed both parents although it just means they just killed one of their parents to start off, we're going to talk about a lesser known case and then work our way up to infamy. I'm sure most of y'all have heard about the last case we're going to discuss. So first we have the story of a little Jasmine Richardson. When Jasmine was 11 years old, she met her soon-to-be boyfriend, Jeremy Stank, who was 23 at a punk show. Jasmine had started getting into the alternate goth lifestyle. She posted on VampireFreaks.com and wore dark makeup and clothes, which supposedly made her look older. But how old can an 11-year-old look? Jeremy had a dark past. His mother was an alcoholic who dated men that would abuse him. He claimed to be a 300-year-old werewolf and wore a vial of blood around his neck. And he had already attempted suicide before he and Jasmine had met. So clearly, it was love at first sight with them. When Jasmine told her parents about a relationship with a man twice her age, they immediately stopped her from seeing him ever again. She contacted Jeremy and told him that her parents were not going to allow them to be together and they came up with a plot to solve the problem. Jeremy posted on a blog saying that he wanted to slit Jasmine's parents' throats. But he also claims that Jasmine was the one who first prompted parasite. Jasmine told Jeremy that she wanted to kill her parents and go live with him, and they worked out the details of the crime. The night before the murders, the couple watched the movie Natural Born Killers, that's real dark to watch beforehand, which includes a crazy homicidal couple who murders the girl's parents so they could run off together. Spoiler alert, that's the movie you watch before you do this. The next day, Jasmine and Jeremy acted out their plan. They started killing Jasmine's mother, Deborah, who was stabbed at least a dozen times. Next was her father, Mark, who was stabbed to death. And last was her eight-year-old little brother, Tyler, who had his throat slashed. The bodies were discovered by a neighbor, and the police were called to investigate. When they did a walkthrough of the house, they realized Jasmine was missing, and thought she was also a victim. An Amber Alert was issued for her, but after they did some investigating into Jasmine, they realized she was a culprit, not a victim. Jeremy was the one who murdered Jasmine's parents, while she was upstairs with her brother. Jasmine claimed to only hypothetically talk with Jeremy about murdering her family, you know, hypothetically, quote unquote but didn't think he would actually go through with it. I mean, he was only twice her age dating an 11 year old. What would you think could go wrong? Well, she was 12 at this point, but they didn't talk about like where she turned 12. Yeah. Jeremy and Jasmine were convicted of the murders. Whose idea do you think it really was to commit the murders? Do you think natural born killers should be a band movie since it inspired actual murders? Do you think a 12 year old, Jasmine, was 12 at the time of the murders and a 300 year old werewolf should be allowed to be in a relationship? Is that a thought worth dying for? Well, there's a lot of questions Rebecca just threw out there. Five if you didn't count them, so let's break <laughs> them down. Whose idea do you think the murders really were? I think it could have been either one. Almost whose idea is irrelevant because the older person should have just said no. 
This is not a thing. We should just... Yeah, yeah. like, if she brought it up first, you as the responsible 23-year-old adult should be like, no, no, no. Ultimately, it's the guy's fault. Someone in that kind of relationship, it could have easily been his idea. It could have been either one. Rebecca, do you think the movie should be banned? Natural born killers. Do you think that caused them to do it? <laughs> no, but I think it was interesting that, like, they watched a movie where you got a homicidal couple who kills the girl's parents and runs away together. Like, it's crazy that they watched that before trying to do that. Also, and we've also seen that movie. We have. The movie's really good if you haven't seen it. It's got Woody Harrelson in it. Great movie. And Juliette Lewis. I think the movie actually shows whose idea it was because obviously I think the guy would have known what the movie was. He used it to, to hype up the killings, to use it as a plan to motivate her. What do you think? Yeah, like I think, I think he, whoever knew that that's what this movie was and like use it as like a plan. The couple in Natural Born Killers, I think they shoot her parents. So it's like still kind of different. I don't exactly remember. Yeah. Yeah, like, I don't think the movie should be banned, but when I was reading the story and I realized that, like, they watched that movie and I had seen it and I really liked that movie, that, like, it was just crazy to me that they used that as, like, their run-through of what they were going to do. I think what, Like, that was their end goal. I think what should be banned, an 11-year-old or 12-year-old's relationship with a 300-year-old that werewolf. Is, yes, that's a crime. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's a 300-year-old werewolf, so um, he's going to be in jail for, I don't know, a million years, because he's not going to die. But that kind of reminds me of the end of Twilight, where Jacob imprints, Spoiler alert! imprints on the baby. Isn't that the same thing, almost? That's even younger than 11. Now, this next one is one of my favorites. I would heard of this a long time ago, and I feel like it was in a Simpsons Treehouse of Horror episode or something, but I've known about this story and the rhyme for forever, and Ethan had never heard of it. And this one is really old. It happened in 1892. Lizzie Borden was born in Massachusetts in 1860. Her father, Andrew, was moderately successful in the manufacturing and selling of furniture and caskets, and later became a property developer but had hard times in the beginning. Because of this, he was still very frugal, even though he now had money. An example of that being the Borden house lacked indoor plumbing and electricity, even though that was common during their time for the wealthy. Lizzie and her sister, Emma, were brought up devoutly religious and both were very active in their church and even taught Sunday school lessons. Lizzie's birth mother died, and a few years later, her father married Abby. Lizzie resented Abby because she thought she married her father for his wealth. The new marriage drove a wedge in between Lizzie and Emma and their parents, so much so that they wouldn't even eat dinner together. Andrew started giving away land to people in Abby's family, which caused a further drift in his relationship with Lizzie. On August 4th, 1982, Lizzie's anger had met its match. She followed Abby upstairs and struck her in the head with a hatchet. After Abby fell, Lizzie struck her at least 17 more times in the back of the head, which killed her. Andrew was gone when this happened, but when he returned, he met a similar fate. He laid on the couch to take a nap when Lizzie struck him 11 times with the hatchet. Lizzie tried calling out to the maid and claiming that someone came in and killed her father. Lizzie denied being the culprit and after a trial, she was acquitted. This crime has its own rhyme, Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. So now that you know that story, Ethan, are you going to pretend that you don't know anything about Lizzie Borden anymore? How do you feel about Lizzie Borden being acquitted? I for real always forget Lizzie Borden. For real. Like he, act, like he acts like he had never heard of that. I know Chris like talks about Lizzie Borden a lot. And I actually rewatched. Uh, I didn't even rewatch it. I was going through uh, Mr. Reality's videos and I saw his Lizzie Borden video. She was just straight up acquitted. She was. And I actually posted about it on Reddit. But I still don't really know the whole story. There's a show that was on Netflix that had Christina Ritchie play Lizzie Borden. It wasn't very good. Wasn't. Just in case y'all want to know about it. So why was she acquitted? Do you think she actually did? I didn't read that because all that part was very long. But it's like the police didn't do a good job investigating. Because like when they went in, Lizzie was like, I don't feel very good. So like they didn't even find Abby right away. Like they had a maid and so Lizzie hollered out like, someone came in and killed my dad. And so like they called the police and the police was looking at the dad and they finally eventually went upstairs and realized that Abby was dead. 
It was like, oh shit, okay. There's someone else up here too. We don't know how to police. We just got hired, guys. So it's yeah. our first day on the job. Yeah, so it's like the police said themselves that they didn't do a good job investigating it. And I don't exactly know why she got off, but I feel like it's because they had money. Our last and final case is one of the most famous familicide cases. I'm sure almost everyone watching this video has heard of this case, especially if you like horror, if you read the book, you've seen the movie, or all of the above. It centers around the Dutch colonial style house in Amityville, New York. It's infamous, you guys. You guys all know what I'm talking about. Ronald Joseph DeFeo Jr. was a known user of heroin and LSD. It is also said that he had an antisocial personality disorder. On November 13th, 1974, Ron Jr. took a rifle and shot his father, Ron Sr., his mother, Louise, and his four siblings, Don, Allison, Mark, and John Matthew. All victims are found to be shot face down on their beds. The parents were both shot twice, while all the siblings were just shot once. It's also thought that Louise and Allison were awake at the time of their murders. The family had been given sedatives, so they would surely be asleep by the time Ron Jr. acted out his plan. Later that day, Ron Jr. ran down to a bar and announced that his family had been shot. Ron Jr. tried to make an insanity plea, saying that he had murdered his family because he heard voices that told him his family was plotting against him. It is noted, however, that Ron Jr. had a volatile relationship with his father. The most pressing matter in this case is that Ron Jr. asked police how he could go about collecting his father's life insurance. So although a motive for this case is not exactly known, it appears that greed was the reason here. Is that more comforting than the house being haunted, or is that worse? I mean, the other version is that the house is haunted and this still happened. <laughs> like, I mean, either way, this happened. So it's yeah. a horrific thing. And I don't, I think life insurance, if this happened, like if he really asked that to police, that's obviously like something he was thinking of and a possible motive. Killing the whole family just seems extreme. Except he wanted to be the sole beneficiary of the life insurance. What if it was really like in his uncle's name or something the whole time? His, so he wouldn't have gotten okay, so the money anyway. Okay, so his uncle was like part of the the mafia or something because it like half mentioned his uncle and it said he was uh, some type of words that looked like it'd be mafia stuff that I didn't know how to say and I didn't want to include that in here but um yeah he did have an uncle who was also a DeFeo who did stuff I don't know but I felt like probably not everyone knew this story per se but like most people have seen the Amityville Horror and have seen that where new people move into this house and the voices start talking to them and get them to do stuff. So I thought that was a good familicide, parasite to end on. Yeah, I think if any place is going to be haunted, it'd be where something dark like that happened. The whole idea that like horror like echoes throughout time, that it comes back, like something like that preserves it in time. I don't know. I definitely think it was greed. I don't think he really heard people if he asked about yeah. life insurance. Yeah, it said that on the Wikipedia page that it didn't have a clear motive for why he did it. He said he heard voices. He asked about life insurance. So like to me, if you're asking about life insurance, he was trying to get some life insurance money. Yeah. Cut and dry. Yeah. Pack it up, boys. We've solved all these cases. Let us know your thoughts on any of these. Did we get any of these wrong? Any ideas? I'm not quite sure. This is Rebecca, so if any of this is wrong, it's on her. Thanks for having me on your YouTube channel, Rebecca. <laughs> You're I've welcome. I've never done this before. <laughs> it seems like it. I know, it's my first time. Be easy. <laughs> Be gentle. There's a lot of parent killing in this video. Some because of abusive situations, some because of mental deficiencies, and some for no reason at all. That's probably the scariest part. Rebecca, do you have any closing thoughts? Well, looking at all these parasite, patricide, matricide things yeah. uh, made me nervous <laughs> about having kids. So I need you to promise me that you're going to be good to Charlie so that that doesn't happen to us. Yeah, one day. You can't just say Charlie because then people are going to think you're pregnant. So uh, that'll be... <laughs> Rebecca's not pregnant. What? You can't just tell me that, Rebecca, on here. Why did you want to get my reaction on camera? That's fucked up. So I need you to promise that you're going to be good to Charlie. That's so not that real. That, that can't doesn't say, happen to us. Oh, whatever. That's not how you read it. 
What do you mean? That's not how you read it. I don't know how you read a pregnancy. Rebecca just shows me a... <laughs> Does it got two lines? Is that yes? Two for yes? Does that have instructions on here? <laughs> do you see a pink line? Is that a pink line? Is that real? That's not yes, real. Yes, baby, it's real. Rebecca's all teary-eyed. How am I supposed to react to this? I don't know, but I panicked. Why did you panic? We're like because I wasn't ex stuff. I wasn't expecting it. I mean, I was. I just took it either. just for fun, and then it was like instantly positive, and I was like, huh, 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 I can't breathe. Huh, I didn't expect it. Huh, panic. Is this what I think it is? What? You have to let Margaret look at. Come look, Mama. Oh my God! Oh my God! <laughs> We're having a baby! Yeah. That's funny! Yeah, I'm more like a lot more relieved because I didn't think I could have kids, so that it's a, it's more relief than anything else. So I'm very very excited and happy. I love you. You're the best. Need you forever. There's no like I'm not panicked because there's no one else I'd want to do this with. Oh, that's and so we're sweet. Yeah, and we're literally at the best time to do it, so it's literally smooth sailing. Of course, I love you. You're the best. I don't love deserve you. you. I wrote you a script to tell you. I know. <laughs> I spent lots of hours. Cause I was put in there just so I could fucking so you could tell me that it's fucked up. Yeah, well, I didn't want to write it out because I didn't know I was gonna be done, so I didn't be like, this is the part where you say you're pregnant and then email that to you. Are you still looking at it? Yeah. It's positive. I just really didn't think it was possible. I didn't either. That's why when I took it, it was. It was like, I wasn't ready for this. Oh my god. I didn't think it was going to be, and now it is. Good yeah, you have asked me time. multiple times this week, like, are you sure you're not pregnant? Are you sure you're not pregnant? And I'm like, let's record this script. Because, I mean, you were pretty late. I already changed the sheets to period sheets, like, a few days ago. I'm like... It's not coming. What's going on? <laughs> so I can do something. All right. I love you. Love you. All right. Let's try to end this somehow. Thanks for watching, strangers. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. As always, comment. Tell Rebecca she did an amazing job. This is pretty crazy, creepy, and strange. So, subscribe if you're new. Hit the bell button if you've been around, so you always know when we re release videos. I'm not very consistent. But I have fun doing it for you. I really like doing it with Rebecca. She's the best. So the first script in a long time that hasn't been by me. So really enjoyed doing it. I don't plan it. on doing it again. I know, but this is so long. So hopefully <laughs> you enjoyed this really long video. If you made it to the end, good for you. If not, you're not listening to this, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but I hope you guys have a fun, safe night. And as always, stay strange.